What I'm going to try to show you today is that you should not take everything for granted which you read in the literature. There, it should be, you, you will always think when you are reading, if even it is coming from the best journal, you should be thinking about uh, the, what you are uh, reading because it could be uh, criti criticized. Uh, the, for instance, you say in uh, uh, modern research, obviously the knowledge of statistic is mandatory and you have to learn the basic of the statistics. I think you have to learn it. There are, I don't know how much study uh, in uh, during the medical study, if you had any introduction to a statistic. If did not, you have to learn it yourself. It's everything is in internet and a couple of pages in internet about this basic, for instance, calculation of significances, sample size. I will show you the examples. You do 50 patients and you have a certain result, you do another 50, the results are different. Is it significant? You have to calculate the sample size. You will be surprised how big number of patients you need to say something which is really significantly different. And uh, when you read the uh, guidelines of the European Association, it says specifically when you write a paper and submit a paper, you should really consult a statistician for that. And this is where you can find it. That is how they, um, on the on the open the journal on the home page of the journal. That is where you find it. The, one of the things, the first thing which you have to learn is to be careful about percentages. When somebody tells you that it is 50% uh, better or is it a 5% difference, distrust the percentages. The, you need the exact numbers. For instance, you in an abstract, you read an abstract, a new operative technique has reduced mortality by 50%. This is impressive. It has reduced it by 50%, though it is something which should be done. But look at the numbers. You look at the numbers. The numbers are like this. With the old technique, two patients died out of 100. Of 100. With the new technique, one died of 100. It's a difference of 50%. And it is probably immaterial, it is unimportant, because this difference can be due to chance. So never, never trust just the percentages, look at the proper numbers. So there is obviously not a statistical difference in this. For instance, the little test for the audience. You read that one treatment has a 20% early mortality, the other one is only 5% early mortality. Is this difference significant? Who thinks that the difference is significant? Raise the hand. Who thinks it is not significant? Nobody is listening to me. It is disappointing <laughs> Nobody, that two people raise the hand. So that is, you see, the, the answer, you cannot calculate significances without knowing the actual numbers. So never trust the significance. If the actual number is one sample, is one out of five, 20%, and the other one is one out of 20, 5%, there is no significant difference. But you must know the numbers. If there are 200 in each group, there will be a significant difference. But this one is P.27. So don't jump to conclusions. Never look at the percentages alone. Look at the original numbers. Only when you have the true numbers, you can make your own uh, decisions about the truth. For instance, a correct statistics of subgroup analysis is something I don't agree even with the editors of some major journals. And these editors, I will show you, they are under influence of medical companies which want to have their work published. The analysis of subgroups, an example, statistically different mortality is observed. Two large studies. One have 18%, the other is 12% and overall mortality is really different, 0.05. It's statistically different. Uh, one chance is only one in 20 that the results would be given by uh, not, not uh, proper true difference. But now, 20 subgroups. These are the examples from the syntax trial. People who are in coronary surgery know that the syntax trial is the most important trial in the recent years which compared uh, PCI, a percutaneous treatment, with coronary surgery. But then they analyzed 20 subgroups, three vessel disease, le left main, diabetes, yes or no, hypertension, yes or no, male, female, gender difference. They go through these 20 subgroups. 
but then you cannot accept 0.05 mortality. I don't know how many of you heard of Bonferroni correction. Has anybody heard about Bonferroni correction? This is a classical example where you have to need the Bonferroni correction. Bonferroni correction basically tells you that the significance of 0.05 this classical statistical significance of 1 in 20, 0.05 should be divided by the number of observations. And then you reach the true, it's a Bonferroni correction, and then we'll find out that, for instance, p-value. And then we suddenly, you have to go to a much higher significance level when you're using this subgroup analysis, depending on the number of subgroups. 0.0025 will be really considered to be st statistically significant. And this is something which, uh, uh, even, even in the best journal, New England Journal has published a statistic with this, which is statistically speaking not correct. I am not a statistician, I've never been trained in statistics. I had to learn it hard way. I, I think you will also have to learn it yourself the hard way, just by reading the books and reading in the internet. This I got from Peter Capitan, he sent me this slide. It is excellent showing <coughs> the, how many patients you need in each group when you perform subgroup analysis. Subgroup analysis, if you're performing 20 subgroup analysis you need, there is about 75% chance that the difference which you found, although statistics shows a 0.05, that it is not insignificant. So that is, you have to go to a much higher number of patients in order to get a proper significance. Then when you do, for instance, here, um, uh, likelihood of significance, field is likelihood to be about 75% that the number you found is really not significant. It is only due to chance. So be careful when looking at the so-called subgroup analysis. And this is, for instance, the syntax trial. They had this excellent trial they, from a number of uh, centers all over the world. And uh, I, was on, I know it very well because I was on the data monitoring committee. We meet every couple of months and then we analyze the data. And then you, for, for instance, suddenly you find out that there is a group participating in a trial. I, I cannot tell you the name of the hospital which among the eight patients which were subjected to coronary bypass surgery, they lost four, 50% mortality. And what, what is to do like this? It is statistical trial, they were accepted for trial, then the data monitoring committee makes alarm, it says it cannot be done, somebody has to go there, look at the data, and they are not allowed to participate in the trial anymore. But you cannot take the data out. So this uh, four dead patients, they stay in the statistic in there forever and they will be calculated all the time. Going back, this is the number of uh, uh, the vari uh, variations which they are in the gender, male, female, syntax score, you know the syntax score, they make uh, three groups according to the complexity of the coronary artery disease. The LV function is good, reduced or poor, they use H as a three groups, it's easier than to calculate as a continuous variable, diabetes, renal function, etc., etc. And then you come all together, come in 26 sub subgroups. The Bonferroni connection, uh, correction should be used. P-value for significance in 26 variables, you have to reach 0 0.0019. Then only it will be significant at 20% level. So you must be very, very careful in uh, uh, doing this, uh, uh, analyzing that it is, although it has been published by in, in good journals. Spurious correlations are also very common in literature. You will have something correlation, I will tell you about this. The classical example is all hospitals now have a very good database because uh, by law, the patient comes in and everything has to go from the case history, all the findings from cath catheter, all the findings from the lab, they go in a central computer and they are in there. And you can do whatever you want with this. And the people are doing this, where they are good with the statistics, they can, once a year they go into the hospital computer and they make a, do some correlation. Suddenly it comes that the GOT is predictor of the mortality of uh, coronary surgery. A thing like this, it really don't make sense. They are not only correlated, they are not 
causes. And this is, in Latin, it's called post hoc ergo propter hoc. It's, uh, I always told my residents when they bring up this problem, um, it's uh, the classical stat uh, logical mistakes is, in the morning at five o'clock, I get up. Half an hour later, the sun goes up. It's logical the sun goes up because I got up. That is a post hoc propter hoc <laughs> logic, you know. And this is in, in medicine, you see it all the time. There is one of the very good statistician in America makes a joke of the correlation. For instance, there is a very strict correlation because the death between the death on American highways and the lemon imports from Mexico. It's obvious that there can be no logical way how they are related. But statistically speaking, they have perfect correlation coefficient. When you work, somebody of you, if you ever work in a statistical trial, to reach in, in medical statistic, to reach in the patient statistic, to reach a significance of 0.75 is really very, very good. It is very close to being causative. But this one is statistic is a really highly positive correlation between lemon inputs and, uh, and highway death in America. And the second one is also he, he found it out that it's only the governmental data. You can pick it up. It's every year in the American government has to publish these figures. There is a high correlation between American spending on science, science, space, and technology and suicides by hanging. That it's just correlated, but it is nothing than a pure statistical trick. It is, there is no logical correlation between them. So watch out for a spurious correlation when you are reading an article. The rules which I made, it's the, the statistical results, and the, looking at the p-values on chi-square statistics, shows only the association, the degree of association. It says nothing about the causative relationship. It was one related to the other. They are just statistically related in an association, but might be nothing to do one with the other. And this is post hoc propter hoc logic and temporal relationship, one occurring after the other, doesn't mean that they are in any way logically related. They are just associated with, but not related. These are the basic rules. So this is what I told you, the blind analysis of large hospital banks. It's called, by Americans, it's called data mining. It is already there, and you have a good computer. It just throws out, and you sit for a couple of hours, and suddenly significances start coming out. One significance, the other. Uh, GOT level, preoperative GOT level, and the mortality of coronary surgery, things like this, and uh, which are obviously not related, but then it's published. Uh, we publish every year. You can read this uh, abstract to the major meetings. And this is not science. It is just data mining. You can dig out when you, and, uh, Americans like to say to that, torture the data until they confess. You know, it, you press them enough with a statistic, and suddenly something will come out. It's another one of this uh, <clears throat> statistic. I picked it up recently. The more iPhones mean that the more people will uh, die from falling down the stairs. It, again, it is a very close correlation. And it is obviously not close. It's not, they are not falling down because they have an iPhone. But it is closely related, the number of deaths with the number of iPhones. The one question which always comes when writing down, and we surgeons are dealing always with a small number. So it's, a, it's difficult that you have 200 in one group and 200 in the other groups. Here you do something new on the mitral valve, and you will have 20 patients that you want to show something. And you write it, when to use the average or the mean value, and when the median value is. You know what the median value is. Who knows what the median value is? OK, so it's good. You know, the, the highest number, the lowest number, highest number, lowest number. This is the median value. Uh, the rule is that when the uh, mean is very easy. You go and you have it in your computer, in your data, and you have all your uh, you press when they have the whole group in there. The data, you press the button, and it will come uh, immediately. It will cut the mean value, standard error, standard deviation, and confidence intervals. It's, today, the machine does it. You don't have to do it yourself. But uh, the mean value can be totally misleading. For instance, you did aortic valve repair in four patients. Three years of age, three years of age, four year, and ninth year of age. The mean will be 25, and standard deviation is 43. 
what does it mean? It means absolutely nothing. You should not use the mean value when you are dealing with the small numbers. And this is what the many papers which you send to a journal will go back, uh, the editor will sell you. Uh, in the same set of observations, median value is 3.5. It's much more logical because it shows that in this set of values, 3.5 is very close what you would expect as a middle. The median uh, value is called outlier resistant. It takes care not to overweight a value which is way, way out, you know, a 90-year-old patient in another group. So this goes out in a calculation of median value. So the rule of thumb by the editors, when you submit a paper, observation, abstract, whatever, in a number, when if there are less observation than 30, then you use only median values. Mean values are used when there are more than 30 observations. That's a rule of thumb, which is now universally accepted by most editors and most journals. A word about uh, critical reading. I am very suspicious of the trials which are fully supported by the industry. Because the, when they are supported by the industry, it very often happens statistically significant uh, difference is that the results of the trials which are supported by the industry will be positive for the product. This has been, I suggest, go and read this paper from Journal of American Medical Association, 2006. They made an analysis. What trials are percentage of the trials which will be positive, which says, yes, there is a significant difference using a new drug, using a new valve or whatever. They looked at this in all trials. And they looked at clinical endpoints, at the drug trial and the device trial. And it is a very interesting observation because when you look in all trials, there will be about 50% of the trials will come positive and the 50% will be negative. No difference, no statistical difference. This is for the, the trials which are run by non-for-profit organizations, usually universities. This is a university which runs, there is about 50% a chance that the difference will be statistically significant. When it is run by industry, in red, when the industry paid for the trial, about the devices, 82% of the trials will be statistically significant. It does not mean necessarily that the people who do these trials are cheats. The industry goes, of course, supports the trial when they expect that it will be good. On the other hand, I will show you the examples. There is a strong pressure for the industry. I've been on this both trials, on Syntax um, trial and uh, Excel trial, which is still running now in the Data Monitoring Committee. We had a lot of discussion. When the industry support shows, and they we meet every couple of months and uh, there is a certain pressure. They will know this is not good, it's uh, not properly calculated, we drop this, we don't publish this. So <clears throat> this shows the strong influence, how you have to be very careful when you read where, who supports the trial. There was a, if you remember in 2003, uh, there was a very strong recommendation coming from uh, um, American, uh, the American College of Cardiology and the American Heart Association that uh, an uh, implantable defibrillator should be put in every patient who is uh, ejection fraction is less than 30 percent at least one month after infarction or three months after coronary artery bypass surgery. I thought this is terrible because it is very expensive. I don't know what are your rules here, but to put in every patient a month after infarction who has injection fraction less than 30% is a huge number of patients. And uh, implantation of a defibrillator cost me in Zurich about 80,000 uh, euros on the modern defibrillator. And uh, this is a very important recommendation. But then you go in the same paper, you go on the last, it's behind the last page, you are using so-called so conflict of interest. The authors have to write where they are getting additional income. And then you find out that eight out of 11 authors receive a strong financial support for the research, for the lectures, for the travel they go. They are eight out of 11 authors are supported by the industry. 
when you speak to the authors or to the editors of the journal, say, how did you expect, uh, accept it? They said, if I take for the uh, advisory only the people who are not paid by the industry, they are no good because <laughs> the industry takes the best researchers and they give them money. And so it becomes very closely related. My advice is look always when the, something comes which is obviously supported by somebody. Go to the, turn to the last page and look and there, there is always a list of conflict of interest. Exactly the same at the scientific meetings. There must be a list of the conflict of interest. Look at this conflict of interest. You will be surprised how often there is a conflict about the topic which they are presenting there. So that is just a matter of careful. The industry <coughs> influence this is the one which I was directly involved in. Uh, there was a lot of uh, discussion about it. Two trials have been done in the last years comparing the percutaneous intervention, the stenting, and coronary artery bypass surgery in left main disease and three vessel disease. Left main disease is a serious matter, you know, that there is a mortality involved. So that it was designed, so-called EXCEL trial and the NOBLE trial. Uh, two independently run trials. EXO trial was an industry support sponsored trial. It was uh, sponsored by Abbott Laboratories. I was on the data monitoring committee. I don't get any money from them. It's uh, just a meeting every year. We have to sit down uh, together and they will, might pay me a, a, a travel there, but nothing more than that. Noble trial was fully independent. It was uh, supported by the Aarhus University in uh, Denmark. These are the results of the Excel trial published in New England Journal of Medicine a couple of months ago. And they show that death of any cause, shown up here, there is no statistically significant difference between the mortality with the PCI and the mortality the coronary bypass grafting. And this was statistically insignificant of the um, point one one and the difference is not significant noble trial comparing exactly the same groups of patients which are done mostly in northern Europe and Western Europe shows statistically highly significant difference after in the, between the mortality with the PCI with the stenting and coronary surgery. Coronary surgery has a much lower mortality. And this is also highly significant 0.01. What is the, the it's a 0.01 is really highly significant difference. Excel mortality was reported at, it was, it's called censored. It was reported until three years and then they draw the line after three years and that is what they publish. In the data monitoring committee, which I had access to this, there is this picture. Data monitoring committee goes beyond three years and there is suddenly becomes the big difference. PCI has a higher mortality than coronary bypass grafting. It was not published. There was a decision of the uh, co organizing committee of the trial that this is not, uh, it was censored at three years, we published results at three years. I am afraid that the people will be dying later on the trial who have been in the stenting group. And this is what shows what the industry influence can do in such an important trial. You see the difference which shows uh, in the Excel trial when you go for a longer period of time. This, uh, this is a dilemma, something I'm always <coughs> having my own opinion, that the randomized controlled trials, they're now considered the best in science, what it is. But you, if you want to have something really valid statistically, it is a randomized controlled trial, which you take patients with the same disease, you give one treatment or the other treatment, take a drug or take a placebo. This is considered the absolute validity. And this is how it looks, the pyramid of the level of um, statistical uh, evidence. The lowest significant is animal research, editorials, opinions, case reports also are very low in the statistical validity. As a surgeon, I do not quite agree with this because every operation which we do now has started 
20, 30, 40 years ago started with a case report. Somebody had a good idea, had done it, uh, done it and it worked, and he publishes a case report or a small case series, five or six patients. First operation of the aortic ascending aneurysm was done by Cooley and DeBakey. It was one case. It was a case report, but it started the whole uh, surgery of the ascending aorta, which was previously not done. And then it, when you go further on the evidence, this is all level C. Level C is basically something which is not useful. It is not reliable. It is called C when you look at these statistical tables. Level B are case control studies. You do a, you analyze then. 200 mitral valve repairs. Either you look backwards, that is a retrograde statistic, or you look forwards with your, follow your cases, but then it is a case control study. And the cohort study is just analyzing one single group or the particular disease, whatever. This is a level B. And finally, you have the, uh, I'm sorry, and uh, somehow it doesn't work. The highest level are randomized control studies and double blind studies. This is considered the highest level of statistical evidence. There is, um, might be a problem there. This is the kind of table you will always read. This is from the, for instance, for European Association and European Society of Cardiology. Uh, this is how they do it. In green, class one, these are the recommendations which are really statistically valid and they should be listened to. And uh, they have this uh, class one will practically always uh, go for the highest recommendation. There is a lot of discussion about the randomized control trials. I will just show you a series of objections, which some of them I fully there. First objection to this is selection bias. You take only suitable patients. It has been shown again and again. I will show you examples how the trials of the catheter treatment versus surgery treatment, the patients are very carefully selected with those who are suitable for catheter treatment, and then there is no difference. This is so-called selection bias, taking low-risk patients. Then the bias which is always in there, it is ascertainment, analysis bias. The people who are getting the results from these trials, statisticians and the clinicians, they get the huge number of data, but they know what treatment was applied. In reality, to be totally independent, they should not know if they are analyzing surgery or analyzing a catheter treatment. But this is not the case. It is in all trials, there is, they are not blinded. And then, of course, there is a population bias. You can make a limit. You think that, uh, for instance, the PCI is not good in, a, in an older patient, so you decide to, make, to limit the trial at 75 years of age. All who are older don't enter the trial. This is a pre-trial pre selection. And it, there are all others. For instance, a learning curve in surgical trials. This is well known. It is last, it ha happened in an analysis of the off-pump surgery, coronary surgery. Off-pump coronary surgery was uh, analyzed in several trials. One is the so-called RUBY trial, or the American Veterans Administration. You know what the Veterans Administration Hospital is in America after you served in the armed forces, whatever, then you and your family have until the rest, rest of your life, you have a free medical care, which is a huge investment, which is a good thing. It should be like this because the people are also damaged in the war. Uh, it, it goes even so far that the government will bury you without expense. There are huge, if you have been, for instance, in Hawaii or uh, San Diego, there are huge military cemeteries, perfect order. It's a, something beautiful to watch, all paid by the uh, American Veteran Administration. They have done this trial and they have compared off-pump surgery with the on-pump coronary surgery. I don't know, have you, who has heard of Ruby trial? In a Ruby trial found out that there is no difference or even a little worse results with off-pump surgery. What has happened is they have taken, after you have done 10 off-pump bypass, you, bypass, you were allowed to enter trial. And on the other hand, you have been performing coronary surgery already for 10 years and done hundreds of them. 
you cannot do like this. You must have a certain level of knowledge in both treatments which you are comparing. And this is a problem with the, uh, even now, the problem remains that there is no clear-cut difference between uh, off-pump surgery. I introduced off-pump surgery in, uh, in Zagreb, in this hospital, which I helped to start. And this has really revolutionized their coronary bypass surgery there. They are now perfect. They can do it all without me. I don't have to go there. But it, it went down, the mortality of the coronary surgery went down to less than 1%. And uh, incidence of cerebral complications went down also because you don't cannulate aorta. You don't use cardiopulmonary bypass. And uh, so I, I truly believe that off pump surgery is a good thing to do, but it doesn't come up in statistical trial, mainly because the learning curve bias. The surgeons are not equally competent with both methods. It has happened, <clears throat> I am old enough to remember this, it happened when the trial when the uh, ruptured gastric ulcer came. It was a very common disease before the treatment came, uh, the, the drug treatment. It was very common disease, and young surgeon you would do every night, you know, that it will be ruptured gastric ulcer. And then came the new treatment. We were treating ruptured gastric ulcer with a gastric resection, BILROT1, usually was possible to do. And uh, then came the treatment of vagotomy and just suture vagotomy and pilloroplasty. The vagotomy and pilloroplasty is much simpler operation. It uh, really takes you about, vagotomy and pilloroplasty takes you about half an hour altogether. And uh, the Danish trial compared this in a huge group of patients. It was a common disease. And they found a little worse results, more complication with vagotomy and pilloroplasty. Again, the explanation, it was done with the surgeons who for 20 years operated in the classic way, bilrot resection, and uh, then they started something new, vagotomy and pilloroplasty, and their pilloroplasty would not hold, it would be a later problem. This also, this in all surgical trials, this learning curve bias is very, very important. And this is something which is not understood by statisticians. They don't realize that there is a difference between taking a pill and a placebo and doing a complex operation in one or other way. That's uh, uh, something which has to be kept in mind. There is outcome choice bias. If you add, add uh, other outcomes, for instance, the classical statistic is always mortality, yes or no, patient alive or not alive. But when you start adding another all factors, for instance, in coronary trials, is very often the stroke, mortality, and re-revascularization. Then, then you start adding things, and then it becomes more difficult to judge. It becomes easier to turn the results in one or the other direction, you know, if you uh, add different uh, outcomes. And then it's, of course, the crossover bias. Crossover bias, I will explain you what it is. It means that people are accepted, patients are accepted for one method, and he doesn't want to do it. You cannot force him, and he goes to the other method. That is, and uh, of course, negative results bias, it's many people that have experienced that. If you have negative results, it's difficult to publish. Journal editors don't like to publish negative results. It's what is new, it doesn't work anyway. So the, it is, the fact is that it is, if you reach negative results on a trial, it becomes difficult to find a publication. This is for me a classical bypass. I don't know uh, if you uh, remember this study. It is a very old study. It started in the late 80s in Glasgow. In Glasgow, every patient who went for a uh, aortic valve replacement was strictly randomized in a, either mechanical prosthesis or a biological prosthesis. They had nothing to say. It was English system. It was a social security system, and the patient had to accept that. And this is a, it's a very interesting result. They have been following now for 20 years this patient. There is absolutely no difference between the mechanical valve and biological valve in the long run when you truly randomize the patient. This is how the trials should be done, and this is the really unbiased trial. All patients were included, and then it was just drawn out of the, you would open an envelope, it says, it would say me mechanical valve, and then they get mechanical valve. The <clears throat> funny uh, article appeared several years ago. And the question was if an obvious fact in medicine 
should be also supported by a prospective randomized study. For instance, the coronary artery bypass grow, uh, grafting increases flow, or then the aortic valve replacement abolishes the gradient. It is not necessary to establish trial for obviously logical thing. And this is a paper, and you have to find it if you have time. It is such a funny, it was written by two scientists in the British Medical Journal. Uh, British Medical Journal publishes a week before Christmas. It publishes always a kind of a funny article, but it's still strictly scientific article. It was, uh, they had a couple of years ago, they had the article of the value of drinking red wine and doing physical exercise. And finding after very thorough analysis of the literature that drinking red wine is more protective for coronary artery disease than doing exercise. You know? And it's one that, this one was a statistical trial of the validity of uh, parachute jumping. If the parachute jumping really prevents death, because if the people have fallen out of the aeroplane in the Second World War and survived falling in the woods and snow is right. On the other hand, they jumped with a, uh, a parachute and, uh, and killed. And uh, so it was not true. What they say here, it's, a, in, it's a written in a scientific tone, we were unable to identify any randomized controlled trial of parachute dumping. <laughs> if you should open a parachute and not open, it was not done. It is not a, a validity of parachute protection in jumping from the airplane has not been proven in a prospective randomized. And the conclusion is that uh, the many interventions which are used in medicine, effectiveness of parachute has not been, sub not been subjected to rigorous evaluation. And advocates of evidence-based medicine, that everything has to be proven in the trial, have criticized the adoption of interventions using only observational trial. <clears throat> we think that everyone might benefit if the most radical protagonists, statisticians, we think only this is right, prospective random but protagonists of evidence-based medicine participated in a double-blind, randomized, placebo-controlled crossover trial of the parachute jumping. You should jump on the airplane with or without parachute. That is a logical difference. The crossovers remain, for me, one of the unsolved problems, in, uh, especially in coronary artery bypass grafting. These are the studies from the 80s, where the coronary bypass grafting was, uh, was in, a, in a prospective way, uh, randomized, uh, was uh, controlled versus medical treatment for angina, medical treatment of coronary artery disease. And there was followed a group which was operated and the group which uh, had a medical treatment. What happened after 10 years, that about more than 40% of the patients who had the medical treatment went and had surgery because the coronary angina started again they had a, a coronary surgery, 40% of them. But for a statistical analysis, because it's intention to treat, they stay in a non-operated group. It doesn't make sense, but this is what the statisticians tell you. The only way to treat crossovers, switching from one group to another, is to have them as they were intended to be and not as they are actually are. So this short analysis of the problem. You have 200 patients, you have randomized and coronary artery bypass grafting and PCI. It's 100 in one group and 100 in the other group. 15 patients refuse surgery. They want to have a PCI. And what to do now? You can count them in coronary artery bypass grafting, although they didn't receive it. This is intention to treat. This is statistically accepted method. You can count them in a PCI group. It's so-called actual evaluation. It is statistically invalid. Then you cannot publish the study if you put them in the a group which they actually treatment they received. Or you can drop them from trial, completely from trial. This is per protocol analysis, it's called method. What happens is suddenly you are not having enough patients in the group to, to have the statistical difference. So the intention to treat, although illogical, it seems stupid to have a patient who has coronary bypass graft to keep him in the PCI group or, or other way. But this is the only way to treat this problem. <clears throat> the, my objection, second objection to the randomized trials, is that the results are taken from a very small group. And uh, this is uh, usually because of the, the various objections. We have participated in Zurich in so-called ARTS trial. Decision was to have all patients with a three-vessel disease 
in this period 1997 until May 1986 to have them randomized uh, to receive either coronary bypass grafting or PCI. And finally, what happened in this, that 61% had a PTCA, the coronary intervention, 38% coronary bypass grafting, and only 0.5% was determined by the cardiologists they can be randomized. So you see the randomization becomes super selective. And uh, there are numerous examples. For instance, I have put once, I had to give a lecture somewhere in uh, this randomized studies of comparing PTCA to coronary bypass grafting. All these studies together, they have the names like Rita, Erachi, Gabi, you are, you are, many of them are too young to remember this. But um, they had 91,000 patients were analyzed in these trials. It's a real group, very solid group of patients. And from then, the data to recommend either coronary surgery or PCI were derived. But when you look at this, out of this 91,000, only 4.9% were randomized in trials. So it means, again, it's a super selective. More than 95% of patients never entered the trial because cardiologists or surgeons consider them not suitable. They either should go in one or the other direction, not randomized. The randomized trials do not represent the classical um, uh, situation which you see every day in your practice. And then the trials uh, have been often observed to give better results in patients than in those which are not included in trials. And this is a very instructive example of the so-called nifedipine trial. Nifedipine is a calcium antagonist, as you know. Nifedipine was tested in an American trial in acute myocardial infarction. And the people were randomized to receive either nifedipine or standard treatment. What happened is that the people who were excluded from trial for some reason had 27% mortality of the myocardial infarction. The people who were accepted for trial had in placebo and in nifedipine much, much lower mortality. So again, it shows that there is some pre-selection of patients taking place before they enter the trial. You cannot accept this as an absolute truth. You have to look at the whole thing. And then this is my ob also objection to these trials. <clears throat> Previous trials have accepted only low-risk patients. This is from David Taggart has made this statistic. It's all this, it's difficult to read. But Finally, what he found in all these trials between PCI and coronary surgery, 100% of all patients had a normal electrical injection fraction. We don't see in surgery, you see very rarely now, I don't know how it is with you, but we rarely see a patient which has a more than 50% injection fraction. Only 41% had a proximal LAD and only 16% had diabetes. Normally it is about 25% have diabetes or, or even higher. Here is probably even higher with 40%, you. 40% of our patients uh, are yeah. diabetes. Here it was in all these trials only 16%. Diabetics are more difficult. It's no, they said their, their coronary disease is more diffuse and uh, more calcification and similar. So this is from David Taggart. Right? So <clears throat> to summarize the drawbacks, too many exclusion criteria, selection, the people uh, who enter the study are already selected by their doctors to go in one or the other trial. And then there is a difference in quality of care. I told you this terrible 50% uh, mortality of coronary artery bypass grafting in one hospital in South America, which was pa participated in this trial. And uh, this results will still uh, press uh, negative influence on the results of Syntax uh, Excel trial. Crossovers are subjected to intention to treat. There is no other way to deal with this, but the crossovers are unsolved problem. It, it defies the logic. You leave the patient in a PCI group, although he had a coronary surgery, but he is analyzed until the end of his life, he will be in a PCI group, not in a coronary surgery too. The long duration of trial, and these trials go to mostly five, six, seven years. Um, Excel trial is now uh, four years, and uh, Syntax trial is well before five years. And this, uh, for instance, in Syntax trial, which was used in uncoated stents, which are inferior results. Uh, between the surgery, the methods has changed. 
And finally, you will not believe how much it costs. It's syntax, when I joined, that was, a, was already in 50 million now. It is well about $80 million. It's costed analysis of uh, 1,800 patients. Th these are the numbers which you have to deal with. It's impossible for the university to pay for this. The Excel trial, the next the follow up trial, is already well above $50 million in the, in the results. And this is my advice. I don't know, should we make a pause? It's, I, I hate to speak alone all the time. It, it, should be, it should be more discussion about that. Questions and comments. Yeah, I can, I can do the, the question. Yeah. Actually, uh, it is very important what you have said. That, uh, all these biases, they are they're very, very important. Yeah. And I always... I'm always very careful when I see a trial which is non-inferiority, as you said at yeah, the beginning. Yeah. But you know, when you join the congresses and when you discuss with cardiologists as yeah. a surgeon, because I've done a couple of times, mm. this, it's always they're showing us very well randomized, very well uh, high statistics, uh, statistics. Uh, uh, it's not the inferior. Colored, colored slides and everything. Uh, and we're uh, facing uh, this with the. Uh, Drugs like Pravix and Ticagrelor, uh, we're trying to ask and to convince cardiologists that it's, there is no benefit this to be given before no. PCI, before mm. diagnostic, but they still do. Mm. And the argument of our, one of our colleagues last, last year during the meeting was that, okay, we have randomized trial showing that it's better to give this. And, even if you have one or two patients from 1,000, it's better mm. to give it. Mm. It doesn't matter mm. that few of them will die or yeah. something like from bleeding. So, is it really the way to trust these randomized trials, or mm. it's better to take care about the... Uh, um, what was that? The observational, observational trial. Observational trial, trial is to take a group, and I give this group, I give take care of all before, and this one start afterwards, five days after surgery. Uh, I can tell you, I, I have a very strong opinion about this. I start on my coronary patients, they get, after the end of the operation, they, they are usually not under uh, platelet inhibitors uh, because of the problems with the bleeding and everything. But immediately after surgery, they are stable in ICU, they come from the operating room in ICU, I start them on IV heparin, 25,000 per 24 hours. And if they don't bleed at the three hours at the beginning of heparin, uh, they get half a gram of aspirin IV. And this covers very well the uh, platelet adhesiveness in most of the patients. Uh, I had once a talk, one of the Nobel Prize winners who is a specialist, in, especially in the platelets, he told us that the aspirin is so effective that it's really not necessary for an average patient. There are some who do not react, you know that. Some are non-reactors on aspirin. But the normal reactor, there are 85% of the patients are reactors. It is enough to keep a tablet of aspirin in your bathroom and in the morning, just lick it. This already produces a substantial inhibition of platelets, so they are very, effect uh, very of the effective drugs, which they are, and I think they should be used more. And then I will show you, I have a slide about this, the difference in this trial, of the Syntax trial, the people with the surgical patients were treated inferiorly, they had a totally different drug treatment. By the way, uh, because you said aspirin, uh, there is no proof, or at least I don't know to get proof, by the randomized trials that uh, prophylactic use of aspirin helps to prevent the myocardial yeah. infarction. Yeah. So I, I stopped using aspirin, but I have taken it for 20 years. One thing which is proven about the prophylactic use of aspirin, you don't get colon carcinoma. They, they have a, and nobody understands why, but obviously there is an inflammatory, inflammatory protection when you're taking aspirin. And there is a, quite a strong evidence for inflammatory uh, agents, uh, inflammatory etiology of atherosclerosis. The people who are delivered, uh, the cardiologists know that, the people who are delivered in the hospital with the inst unstable angina have always elevated CRP. Elevated CRP is a part of the syndrome, so I mean, there is inflammatory reaction. And I'm sure you have seen 
some of the patients which you operate early after infarction, sometimes you have to go in uh, because there is a kind of problem which you have to solve immediately. The patient, they cannot be kept on the balloon pump. And uh, you can see on the fresh, uh, when there is on the area of the coronary artery, you can even see some uh, visible inflammation signs. There are some microvasculature, you can see it, a little reddish. Uh, the fresh arteroma is inflammatory. Mm. Besides, the problem with the uh, prevention is, uh, the, uh, as always, is the uh, risk-benefit ratio. Mm -hmm. uh, the problem with aspirin in this case is that this risk-benefit ratio is, uh, well, not so proven uh, for a long time, especially in, uh, in, in people who are at low risk. That's yeah. the problem, a low risk patient. So, in this case, it's not uh, it's not acceptable. Yeah, this no. benefit ratio. Uh, the same st stands also for statin, for example. No. Uh, given a statin for a low risk patient no. uh, for a long time, uh, I, I also think that it's not a proper thing. No. You know, the annual cost of statin in the United States was published two or three years ago. Uh, just one company, a Japanese, who makes one of this, they sell, uh, they, uh, they, there's a theory that every man after 50 and every female after 60 should be taking statin. They earn annually in the United States alone eight and a half billion dollars. Eight and a half milliard, and this is the win. Of to, course, they find uh, they find the people who will write a article that it is necessary to take uh, <laughs> statin. And when analyzing a trial, you must look at the material methods, and this is the most interesting information. This is the syntax trial of the coronary surgery uh, versus percutaneous intervention. And it says in here, when you read from New England Journal, the study had all comers design. Everybody who entered the hospital with a coronary artery disease was involved in the trial. This is on the first page of the syntax trial. When you look at the, it's of course too complicated to look at it. I've written down two years in 85 centers, 51 patients entered trial annually. It's a ridiculous number because the centers who sees only 51 patients with a three vessel disease should not be functioning, you know, it's not enough. But this is what shows the pre selection which was taking place. And then when you look at the actual results, and these are 1,800 patients who underwent randomization at the cost of $80 million. Now, there were only 11 patients per center annually. So, it should be believed really that all comers, all patients who entered the hospital were really entered the trial. It's, it's ridiculous. I refuse to believe that it's a super selection is taking place. And out of this super selected small group of patients, the recommendations will be given for treatment of everybody. And this is the drawback of this type. Sorry. The low incidence indicates high degree of selection. Every number uh, is 36, that they are all commas eligible, high degree of preselection. My second major objection is the drug treatment after surgery, exactly what we have been discussing now. When you look at the patients who have been treated with the PCI, tianoperidine, um, it is a, a platelet inhibitor, was given to 97% of the treatment patients of PCI and less than 20% of the patients who received surgery. And when you look at the results after any platelet drug and the end of the discharge and 12 months after randomization, 73% of patients in the PCI group had still platelet inhibitors and only 17% had surgery. So in my opinion, the trials which has a different method of uh, drug treatment in both groups is statistically not valid. I had a huge discussion with them. I was in Boston several times with a, uh, no, it is decided like this. We cannot force. The surgeons don't want to give it. We cannot um, tell them the surgeon they must give aspirin and uh, must give ticogralor uh, because if the patient bleeds, then the company will be responsible. It's a, a re excuse for them. So there is statistically is invalid. And then here, when you look at this, the authors designed the study 
in their steering committee in collaboration with the sponsor. So Boston Scientific had a very strong word when designing the trial. So there is a pressure that went on, not so subtle pressure from the organizer. And they, of course, they paid $80 million uh, for this. So they want to have a good results out of that. I think that there is still a place for old fashioned prospective uh, trials. When you look, for instance, this data is from a coronary artery bypass grafting at three years, and you have a 28% higher mortality in the patients who, re who received PCI. Stenting has a, um, a low, uh, stenting has a much higher mortality, late survival is much lower. And, this, and these are data which are in a huge number of patients. This is the New York cardiac registry. I don't know if you are familiar with that. In New York, if you do a cardiac surgery or if you do a coronary intervention, it goes automatically in a trial. And this, uh, this is system is dealing with the 59,000 patients. There is no discussion about this data here, that it is 28% better survival with coronary surgery. The other one shows, again, 20, more than 20, 100,000 uh, patients. And again, the same thing comes up. A problem which I, I spent the last 25 years of my professional life as editor of various journals, European journal, uh, now I'm also associate editor in, in another journal, and I will be here in your journal, that I heard oh. yesterday, yeah, that uh, the problem in the literature for me is the truthfulness. I doubt some of the data, and uh, I can show you the data to support it. I think that the cheating is coming more and more because the many young people who are entering science are forced to produce results in order to further their career. If you produce negative results after two or three years, you have to look for another position. This is the statistic of the editors look at this all the time. Percentage of science papers which have to be retracted annually. That after one or two years, somebody comes up, it's not true. Uh, the uh, university analyzes the data, says it is not true. The percentage is rising rapidly since uh, 2005. More and more pap uh, papers have to be retracted because something is wrong. Either it is not truthful or they omitted certain groups. So the cheating exists in science. And interestingly enough, speaking of correlations, highly reputable journals with a very high impact factor, like New England Journal, like Nature, Cell, and Science, have a much higher proportion of the papers which have to be retracted. The people are obviously trying to get their publication in a very good journal, and uh, then they are found out as um, cheating. Highly rated journal with a high impact factor have a higher uh, retraction index. Retraction index is number of uh, number of papers which are retracted per hundred papers published. And that's a retraction index. Nowadays, there is uh, this advantage of the modern computing. There is a system which we all use in all journals. When you, uh, it's called authenticate. Authenticate is automatic comparison of the paper as it was submitted. It comes to the editorial office. It is scanned by the computer because it's the word format and automatically compared to the whole present literature up to now. And it, it, it's a nice drawing because they have, a, you see somebody is making a Van Gogh painting. They makes another one here in this. The results, <clears throat> it is easy to detect. For instance, this is one um, cross check which crossed my desk some time ago. And then you see that here it is also colored when the computer comes out with a similarity. You find, for instance, a cross check 1,148 words were taken from this paper in the European Journal of Cardiology. And again, in number two, it was taken out from internet, from this publication, from internet. Really copy it, copy paste, you know, like this and put it in your text. It's very easy to do nowadays. And then it goes, uh, <clears throat> for instance, cross-check from a paper of this flora paper, midterm outcome equality. It comes up immediately. You don't have to work anything about it. It is, uh, the computer produces it. It's a next page again, comes again and again. It is colored, it is taken that it was copied it from somewhere. Yeah. How it could be done 
not to consider that it's a uh, okay. You need to say it in the proper way, the, the yeah. whole thing. If you write, for instance, a uh, chest was open with a medium stenotomy, ascending aorta, and both vena cava were cannulated, patient that put on cardiopulmonary bypass and cooled to 30 degrees. Every paper about the valve surgery has, this is discarded because that is not a copying, you know. That is, but if you go into a serious analysis of the events and then you copy the whole parts of the manuscript, this is not allowed. But, uh, the, of course, the editor will discard these similarities, which are so obvious that you cannot write it in any different way. Yeah, but can, you, can you write that, for example, that uh, uh, you say that, that uh, someone is it in his manuscript that we have about 25% recurrent mitral regurgitation three years after mitral valve repair. Yeah. You have to put the name of the author can you do it this way? Is it yes, you can, you can. I will, I will show you how, how it can be done. Here, the, this copy-paste is dangerous. You, it is absolutely permissible to do it. It must be clear marked as such. Usually in text you put it either italics mm -hmm. or you put it in the brackets. And then you put a sign, number, literature quotation number 14 or number 15. Then you can do it. But then you show where you have taken it from. And on the other hand, some the most obvious thing is any you know, median stenotomy, going on bypass, giving cardioplegia. This is always the text is the same. Nobody cares about it if it is similarly published. The group of um, serious um, editors of scientific journal keeps a so-called retraction watch. I don't know if you ever heard about retraction watch. Who has heard about it, retraction watch? It's something, go to internet, it's free, you know, just put in the retraction word. You have the names and the numbers of all the people who are cheating in science and who have been caught cheating. <laughs> the, for instance, Yoshitaka Fuji, uh, uh, Japanese, he's a, it's a newest one, I just downloaded because coming here. He has been caught in 183 cases of cheating. Basically, <laughs> practically all of his publications have been, have been uh, really, they have been not a research. It was nothing was done in these patients, but he published it. He was just writing it on, on his computer and sending it. And, uh, the other one is, I don't know how many of you know the name of Joachim Bolt. And uh, I will show you. This is the man who introduced hydroxyethyl starch as a volume expander in cardiac surgery. Very much appreciated by the anesthesiologist because when you go in bypass, blood pressure goes down. It's very easy to increase blood volume without giving blood or whatever. And we had terrible problems with it. Our patients were bleeding after surgery. They were too diluted. And they were bleeding. I strongly supported, uh, said the notion that this is hydroxyethyl starch is the cause of that. And uh, the anesthetist always came to me, now look at this, it's, you have to read the literature, look at it, a, he has proven that it is really a safe and uh, it. All of his, 96 of his patients had uh, papers had to be uh, withdrawn. He is in jail now. He was professor of anesthesiology in Ludwigshafen in, in Germany. And uh, he is responsible for probably for some death also. And uh, the, the whole story goes on and on. That, uh, this is a group of editors who take care. This is the Bolt Affair, which uh, I'm sure he caused in Zurich a number of necessary reoperations. And the record of attraction is uh, this Fuji in, in, in Japanese, who is at that time 172 papers have been found. The, <clears throat> the panel find no records of patients and no evidence that the medication was ever given. It was totally lying. It's, it still happens, you know. Of course, you, you finally you, you get caught. This is a recent paper uh, which was also published in Retraction Rate. Mr. Kim has published some uh, uh, the paper. It was uh, about the genetic analysis. He found out uh, that he uh, digitally changed uh, the illustrations he was providing. He has put the blanks in that uh, instead of signs. You know, this is a, uh, from the um, uh, uh, from the electrophoresis analysis, and uh, that was he was again caught here in Nature 2009. Published in Nature, it's a leading journal in, in the field. Uh, 
the plagiarism in the United States, the problem is such of a uh, um, great dimension that uh, American government has introduced Office of Research Integrity. Did anybody knew about Office of Research Integrity? It controls the science. And especially they have a definition of falsification. Falsification in manipulating research material, equipment or process, or changing or omitting, omitting data is also punishable, the data which don't fit into your concept, or results at such that research is not accurately represented. You can go in the United States, you can go to jail for this. And really some people have gone to jail already because of cheating. So I, to summarize, I think that there is a place for smaller units to publish good, non-randomized, prospective or retrospective analysis. Each one of us has a little different patient material. There are specialties. For instance, uh, look at the, the patients in Saudi Arabia, extremely high incidence of atherosclerosis and obesity. Israel, as I'm sure that you know, that Israel, some, uh, some parts of Israel heritage has a very strong uh, preponderance of coronary artery disease. So there is, in each country, there is also a specific group. There is a place to publish even for a small um, units and I hope hope uh, I will be able to help you in the future to publish from this unit here. Thank you. Thank you.